spider it will be shorter. Good, at least you replenish it's an acid. Right. Okay, this is glutamate again. So when you look at a structure, you should be able to know. You know, you should be able to know what you're doing. You should know all your 20 amino acids. Like I said, <laughs> ABCD of biotechnology is your 20 amino acids. Right? So tomorrow you might go for an interview somewhere, you might go to a bank. Right? You might join State Bank of India or a Bank of America, fine. But there might be some guy in the interview. What can he ask? He can't ask you about finance, right? He will test if you are good in your subject. He might want you to do something else. He might be a biologist, who knows? Right? He might ask you how many amino acids are there in the protein. If you don't tell him that there are 20 types and if you, there are acidic and basic, you will be lost. Right? Do well in your undergraduate course. Right? You should know what your basics are. After that, you can do anything you want, doesn't matter. Right? Okay, now how do you get the, calculate the distance? Now, let's say you want to calculate the distance between this atom and this atom. Right? These two are oxygens. Okay, so let's, uh, let's say there is a hydrogen here. You know, will they form an electrostatic interaction? You can actually check. Okay, you can see the distance between this and this is about, uh, so you can read it. I can read it, it's, it's 16 angstroms, the distance from here to here. Okay? So, is 16 angstroms good enough to call it a good interaction? That is what your question is. Right? There are two atoms separated by 16 angstroms. Is that a strong interaction? No, okay? Because now we have cutoffs for all these things. A good hydrogen bond should be shorter than 3.3. A good Van der Waals interaction should be shorter than 4 angstroms. And good electrostatic interaction should be again about 3.5 angstroms. Right? Hydrophobic interaction is of course less than 6, six angstroms. Anything shorter is worth talking about. You can calculate those formulas. You can give energy to this structure. Now in this full protein, Let's say there are 5,000 atoms, right? Now you know four formulas. Can you calculate the energy of this molecule? What's keeping this in place? Right? You know the coordinates of every atom. You can calculate all distances. You know the formulas. Can you plug in everything? That, right? You can calculate the delta G or G for this particular arrangement of atoms. Because all these formulas are kilocalories per mole. In the end, you can just add them all up and calculate the energy of this arrangement of atoms. So now you understand why we need to do, one of the reasons why we need to do, you know, this structure. This is an experimental technique to determine this. Okay? So, when a polypeptide is synthesized, what's happening is it's synthesized as a linear polymer. What's happening during the process? As it's synthesized out to the ribosome, it's synthesized as a linear chain, what's happening? Sort of folds. That process is most of the time spontaneous. Why is it spontaneous? Delta G of this process, where the atoms are coming together, is much lower than B in a linear chain. What if the delta G of a linear chain is much lower? It would fold, right? How that you have a structure, do you think now you can calculate the delta G at least using these formulas? Yes, you can. Right? That is the magic of doing structures. Right? You can take hemoglobin, you can determine the structure of hemoglobin, finally give a number. Hemoglobin, the energy of folding of one hemoglobin molecule is minus 22 kilocalories per mole. Right? Wonderful. You can relate to what you studied in your physics to what is there in your blood. Right? So essentially what does this minus 20 kilocalories per mole tell you? If you take hemoglobin, which is perfectly functional, if you give it 20 kilocalories per mole energy, heat it, what's going to happen? It's going to unfold. Right? The, uh, the energy it takes to fold spontaneously is minus 20 kilocalories per mole. If you give it that energy, it's good. That's essentially what you're doing when you heat, right? You take proteins and heat them up. What are you doing? You are breaking all these 
non-covalent interactions. What are non-covalent interactions? These four we talked about. So don't forget this in your life. If you remember this much, fine. I have done a good job. Okay? So very fundamental. This is all stuff in your biochemistry textbook. I am just doing it again because most of the time I find students are very shaky on these small things. We can tell you so many big things. Okay? But these are the more important things. So don't forget this. Okay? So if you have the structure now, you can multiply all these numbers. That's the magic of doing structure. Right? What are the things you can do? Okay, so this is the connection between physics and chemistry and biology. Okay? So biology is not just working up uh, the 20 amino acid structures. Right? If you remember your 20 amino acid chemical structure, you can actually relate immediately to the chemistry, you can immediately relate to the physics and then you can relate to the biology. That's the connection. Right? You can't remove one out of the other. Okay? If you think like that, biology becomes much more interesting. Okay? Whatever subject you are doing, could be even something like microbiology which is traditionally only working on. But there also if you find patterns, you know, you can actually find it much more interesting. Okay. So, go back to this. So, how to calculate it, I will not do it. Right. Okay. So, this is something what you probably have not seen very clearly in a textbook. This is again from Leninger. What I wanted to show you was this. Hydropathy index. It is a relative scale telling you which is the most hydrophobic amino acid, which is the most least hydrophobic, hydrophobic hydro. Now you look at this table and tell me which is the most hydrophilic amino acid. And which is the most hydrophobic. This is the Hydrophilic index. Okay, this is a relative scale. Which is the most hydrophilic? Go to the 20. One more new thing you can learn today. You can tell your friends. Which are the answer? Most negative. Marjini. Can you read where it is? Minus 4.5. What's the most hydrophobic? The other end of the scale? Isolation. Okay. That's plus 4.5. And minus 4.5 is the other end of the scale. Okay. So isolation is your most hydrophobic amino acid. Now what does it mean for a protein structure? If I tell you isoleucine is the most hydrophobic, what does it mean for the protein structure? Meaning, in terms of the structure, where is isoleucine going to be? Where is it going to be in the structure? Well, meaning if I can, there are two possibilities. Either it's inside or it's outside on the surface. I still see. Inside. Why? How many of you say inside? Half of you at least. Okay, why, is, why should it be inside rather than not, not outside? Or why, why should it be outside and not inside? Hydrophobic. What is on the outside of protein structure? Water. Right? All around. So would it rather be outside or inside? Inside. Inside, right? Inside of your protein is hydrophobic. No water is inside. Waters are all outside. Right? So hydrophobic amino acids will be usually buried inside. Right? A leucine will talk to another leucine, the isoleucine will keep another isoleucine together, like your fat molecules, right? What's going to be outside are all going to be the 
you know, the arginines and the lysines and that's part of it. Is that what you saw in the structure also? All the hydrophilic amino acids were outside of the surface because that's where the contact with water is. And life on this planet is essentially based on water. Right? Different planet in Pluto or some place, if there is life, there is no water, you know, it could be all different. It could be completely different. Okay? But on Earth, it's a water-based system. These 20 amino acids, this is what's going on. Okay? So now you see the connection between knowing your amino acids, knowing the structure, the chemistry, and how it relates to proteins. Okay? It's a very small exercise. Of course, I've taken a lot of time to do this. But what I want is, you know, people going out without any misconceptions. Okay? Reasonably straightforward explanation. All stuff from school. So go back, rewind in your head. Okay? Then you will not forget. That's another technique I, I know from my school days. Go back and think of this lecture and you uh, know, maybe open a textbook. Read it again. It will stick in your head for your life. Okay? So this is what's going to happen. This is the hydrophobic region. This is the hydrophobic region. It's going to exclude water. Water is going to be all around. Okay? So you can calculate the effect of all these interactions, you know, with physical properties. Okay? So this is stuff. Uh, so this going from your linear formula into a folded structure is what we are doing all this time. Okay? The physical forces associated with getting to this. So all this stuff I think you know. Primary structure, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, these are all, you know, the hierarchy of structural organization. Okay? The primary structure is your linear chain. Right? I'm going to say one, two, I'm going to say whatever to the end. Okay? You have your peptide bond. What is this peptide bond? The first peptide bond, let's say here. Okay? Another peptide bond. Peptide bonds are planar. Okay? Then you have helices and sheets. These are all secondary structure elements because they are because they are all held by hydrogen bonding interactions. Right? So they form ordered structures. Naturally they form ordered structures because hydrogen bonds are formed. Right? Uh, then you get the tertiary structure where you take all these secondary structure elements and put them together. Right? So how do you describe this tertiary structure? Describe this. It's a barrel made of yeah. beta. It's a it's a twisted beta sheet barrel. How many strands are there? More detail. How many strands in this barrel? How many can come? Seven. Is that more information? Right. So it's a seven-stranded beta sheet folding into a barrel, right? Can you also describe more things about that special structure? Describe. It's there right in front of you. There is one alpha helix, right? Can you also find out if it was the N-terminal or C-terminal end? Of course, you turn it around, you can get to it tomorrow, you should be able to describe that. Is the helix, you know, in the end terminal or C-term. So, you should be able to describe all this, okay? If you understand that. So, it's what about this? Describe this specific structure. How do you describe? So, you start with the most, you know, the, the overall features first. So, do you see a barrel there? Beta strands making up a barrel in the middle. The twisted, right? Then what's happening? Around that, do you see sets of alpha axis? Right? What is the direction of these sheets? This, this beta strands? All parallel? All pointing up, fine. Now, if I don't show you this picture, you call your friend on the phone. Can you describe this? And can he make a picture in his head of what this is? Can you do that? 
Yeah, you can. You can tell him there is a eight standard beta sheet, all parallel, making a parallel. There are exactly eight indices all around it. Right? The barrel diameter is this many angstroms. You think you can make this picture up? The other end of the phone? Yes. Right? That is why we are talking about primary, secondary, tertiary, and all that stuff. Okay? We should be able to do this. Okay? So finally, we have the quaternary stuff. Right? You can put uh, multiple chains and make uh, you know, quaternary stuff. Proteins are so beautiful. Right? You have examples of hemoglobin, which is four chains. The extremes uh, of symmetric uh, oligomeric proteins are viruses. Uh, 60 chains. You know, sometimes there are 120 chains making up a single virus particle. Okay? Think of a football. That's what it is. You have ribosome, 79 chains. Okay? Plus three RNA molecules. Collagen, which is three chains. So this is the ordinary of course, this is the functionally relevant structure. Ordinary structure is a functionally relevant structure. Okay. This I suppose you know who it is. It is Indian guy. Why did he become so famous? No, I do not drama chandra. What is this molecule? This is the ribosome. Okay. Who is this guy? Now, hardly any Indians who got Nobel Prizes. Even those names you know, you don't know. Venki Ramakrishna. Venki Raman Ramakrishna. This Chennai guy. Okay. Got the Nobel Prize three years back. Yeah. Oh, it was for determining the structure of this ribosome. Okay. Okay. So, we will quickly do a little bit about enzymes, which is what I wanted to talk. Okay? So, uh, this is all the stuff you know. Uh, the enzymes are catalyzed, they are they can catalyze reactions. Ultimately, they can do catalysis simply because they have a very precise arrangement of atoms. Right? Catalysis is all about actually bringing together groups so that reaction can take place. Okay? So, what are the different reactions that can take place? You can have all these six kinds. I think you know, right? There are six kinds of reactions. You can break a bond, make a bond, you can release a, an atom, right? You can have isomerases which can change the conformation, the configuration, okay, and so on. I think you know what these EC numbers are. Okay, so, enzymes can do all these kind of activities. Okay? Our point here is to understand how your structure can explain why it is a transference. Fine. You should be able to answer why it is a transferase, why it can take only why it can transfer only a phosphate group, not a sulfate group. Fine. That's another question to answer. Why it is taking a phosphate only from a nucleotide and giving it to another nucleotide? Third question. But the fourth question, how is it able to do it so fast? An enzyme is what? An enzyme is a catalyst. What is a catalyst? Something which can accelerate a chemical reaction. Right? So these are the questions we are trying to answer. Right? Why is it doing the reaction it is doing? Why is it not a ligase? Why is it a transparation? Why? How can it accept only this substrate? Why is it not doing everything in the world? No. Right? Why is it only transferring this group? And how is it able to do it? So these are the four questions we are trying to answer in general. And why are we looking at structures? Because structures give you the answer for these four questions. Okay. So that is again the magic of doing structures. You can do biochemical experiments and figure out some of these things. Right? You can do a biochemical assay and find out if it is breaking a peptide bond. Right? But does it tell you why it is breaking a peptide bond and not uh, uh, you know, ester bond or a, uh, or a phosphodiester bond? No. It can be difficult, but the moment you have a structure, you know what atoms are there, why it's looking at only a peptide bond and not a ester bond and so on. That is the magic of looking at structures and figuring out the basis for how enzymes function. So, I will just give you one example. Suppose you want a 5 minute break. 
Bora. Let's say you break. 
right? Essentially, what an enzyme does, it's going to break apart, it's going to provide energy to stretch that part and hardly it's going to break apart. So that is why you call, you call it a weak here. Right? That is why the energy diagram is like that. Okay? Once it goes here, of course, it's going to fall down. So this is a typical energy profile. Okay? So what an enzyme does, okay? In a spontaneous reaction, if there is no enzyme, molecules are going to go through this. But it's going to take a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years. What an enzyme does is to accelerate the process. It's going to take this and push it. Okay? It can do two things. It can take a substrate and push it up and then pull it down. Or it can cut the hill down. If you cut the hill down to this, this level, more molecules are going to jump. Right? Is that going to increase the rate of the reaction? It is. Okay, so two ways you can actually increase the rate of the reaction. One is to actually take the substrate, take it up the hill. Okay, that is what is called actually raising the activation energy of the substrate. Okay, destabilize the ground state. You can take it there so that more number of molecules. What is the rate of the reaction? More number of molecules per unit time. Right? So you can do that or you can cut the hill, which is going to happen much faster. So now you get the picture. Right? These pictures help you understand what an enzyme does. Okay. So which of these processes is happening, you know, you can actually both of them must be happening. So is it doing this or the other process? Again, structures will help you answer the question. Okay. So this is what is called the activation barrier. Okay. Uh, so it goes through this transition state, which is very important. This transition state to the high energy state. Okay. How do we know this? This of course was proposed as a catalyst, uh, how catalysts work, you know, about almost 80, 100 years back. Okay. That all reactions, whether it's a chemical reaction, no, everything is anyway a chemical reaction. They go through an activation state where it breaks. Okay. That was proposed long back. Now we know it is true because we have a lot of experimental evidence. Okay. So in this case, Okay, this is just an example for what a transition state is. Okay. Let's say you are breaking this bond. Okay. This is a carbonyl group, oxygen here, or oxygen here. You are going to break this bond. The chemist writes a proposal how this bond is broken. So, now I am sure you learned all you want from you know, organic chemistry earlier. So the proposal is that the hydroxyl ion coming and attacking this. Okay. Electrons getting transferred here. There is a state in which you have a tetrahedral group here. What is the group here? It's completely planar. You can imagine. Okay? C double bond or 2 O's all in one plane. During the catalysis, when the hydroxyl attacks, the hydroxyl is sitting there for a very short period of time. And that particular point of time, it is going through from a planar shape to a Tetrahedral shape. Okay, so from a sheet it's becoming, you know, the tetrahedral shape is a water, right? That pyramid you can imagine in your head. Okay, that is the proposal given by a chemist. Okay. Now, if you want to test this, okay, you can actually make a molecule, okay, like this, which resembles the transition state. Okay. Now, what is this now? Can you recognize this? Phosphate group. And what is the geometry of phosphate group? Tetrahedral. Right? It's not a planar. So you can synthesize a compound like this and actually create a transition state analog. Okay? Similarly, you are going to break this bond. An enzyme is breaking this bond. Right? You know the length of the NC bond. It's about 1.42 angstroms. Okay? When you break a bond, what is your proposal, hypothesis? That the bond is being stretched. So how do you create a molecule which resembles the transition state? You can actually make a molecule like this, synthesize in chemistry, chemically here. What are these two atoms now? What was it here? NC. What is it now? Carbon-carbon carbon carbon bond. Which is longer? Carbon-carbon bond is longer than the carbon nitrogen bond, right? So this is a compound which resembles the stretched substrate. Okay. 
Okay, so you can take these, you can put it in your enzyme and actually see, okay, whether it works. Okay, this hypothesis of this transition state, okay. Okay. Enzyme. You, you all remember your lock your key mechanism, right? You are saying that the substrate is complementary to the enzyme surface. Okay. The substrate is complementary to the enzyme. Okay. Or the enzyme is complementary to the substrate. Okay. Now, what is the relationship between the transition state and the enzyme? You have a substrate. Now, that substrate is distorted, right? You want to break it. Now, is your enzyme complementary to the transition state or is it complementary to the substrate? This is a very important advance in enzymology. Okay? This was proposed maybe about 50 years back, 60, 60 years back. Okay? The proposal that actually your enzyme is complementary to the transition state, not the substrate. Okay? So, that is the theory. How do you prove it? Of course, you can prove it using structures, but now this is what the diagram is. What happens if you, if your enzyme is complementary to the substrate? Okay, now this is what's happening. Your substrate is this thick, stick. Your transition state is a, you know, is this high energy state. Okay, and you broke it and this is what's happening. Okay, so this is your substrate. Now what happens? When your enzyme is complementary to the substrate, how will energy profile look? Is this this is what it will look like, right? If your substrate is completely complementary to your enzyme, it's very happy then, right? All these non covalent interactions we talked about, hydrogen bond, all these things will be the maximum. And what's going to happen to this? Energy profile is going to go below. Now, what's the problem? Now, you need energy from here to here. Earlier, you need energy only from here to here. But now, you need to go so much energy. Is this meaningful? No. Okay. So, actually, the enzyme is not complementary to the substrate. Okay. This was Emil Fisher's idea 150 years back. Okay. Now, we know that it actually should be complementary to the transition state. Okay. What is the transition state? This is your enzyme substrate complex, okay? And your enzyme is actually complementary to your transition state, okay? All these red things are your non covalent interactions. You have four non covalent interactions: hydrogen bonds, hydrolytes, hydrophobic, and electrostatic. Okay? So, where, the, where is the interaction the maximum? Is it for the transition state or for the substrate? Transition. Right? So, the transition state, of course, you are, you are bending this, you need energy. Where is that energy coming from? It is coming from your non covalent interactions. Right? If you need to break a stick or bend a stick, you have to provide energy. Where is that energy coming from? That energy is coming from all these interactions we talked about. Okay? When the substrate is free, it is stable. When the enzyme binds, hydrogen bonds, Androids interaction, all these interactions are there. That is energy available, right? That energy is what is used to actually break the substrate down, for example, right? So energy is not coming from the air. Energy is actually coming from the interactions you are making, physical interactions that you are making. Everything is uh, energy is physical property, right? It's kilojoules per mole. How many kilojoules per mole? To break this, we need how many kilojoules per mole? Where is it coming from? It's coming from the non covalent So now you see the connections between determining structure versus understanding how it functions, right? Because you determine the structure, you can measure all these hydrogen bonding interactions and other interactions. You can add up the numbers and see what is this. Again, a delta G for the reaction, right? Every every substrate product has a delta G. How much, how much is it for uh, glucose becoming carbon dioxide water? Do you know? Again, I am sure you did it in school. Something like two, minus 200, I think. Okay, kilojoules per mole is the free energy of that reaction. That much energy now the enzyme should provide. Only then it will break. 
right? How do you calculate that? Of course, you have an engine which breaks that down. If you make a crystal structure of the complex, you can actually look at all the interactions, use your formula, and calculate the number. So do you have an answer for why it's able to break? Yes. Right? The energy required to break that should be available from the protein. Okay. So that is the point in doing such. So this is a very important uh, concept that the enzyme is actually complementary to the transfer. Only if it's complementary here, it can transfer all this energy and actually break it. Here it's going to be very stable. Just hold on to it. That's it. Okay. okay. So by doing this, if you plot the energy profile, you see, you have actually lowered the height of the barrier from here to this. So as you lower the height of the barrier, more molecules are going to jump from here to there. Right? That is essentially what the height of the reaction is. Number of molecules going across the hill per second. That is what the height of the reaction is. So the hill is lower, more molecules jump per unit. That's, that's, it. that's typical enzyme rates which you have measured. We are imagining in terms of a hill itself, but this is not the case. Okay. So now you, you know that's what an enzyme does. Okay. Of course, energy for it comes even lot of it comes from uh, water also. Okay. See, when your substrate is free, what's happening? Lot of waters are around the substrate. What's happening when it goes and binds inside the enzyme? Substrate is hanging around, enzyme is here. It's surrounded by water molecules. Everything is happening in solution, right? In a buffer. Okay. What happens when this goes into the enzyme? Is it going with all the water molecules as it is? No. The enzyme will strip off all the water molecules. But it's coming in, you know, very, you know, it's all surrounded by water. Enter through the door, all these waters are stripped off. Right? Is that favorable or unfavorable? Energetically. There is lot of water water molecules around your substrate. When you come inside, waters are going out. Which is a favorable system for your substrate? Where lot of water water molecules are around it or most of the water molecules is in the outside which is free entropically, which is better. Where most of it is outside in the solution, that is entropically favorable. The entire is very high, right? That is also contributing to all of this. So, so the, the enthalpy and the entropy contributions all come under this delta G over, okay? So the enthalpy contributions come from delta H comes from your four non-covalent interactions, right? All that contributes to delta H. Your delta H term in the delta G formula comes from the water. Okay, so now you get a physical picture. There's of course a lot of you know equations you can derive for all of these things. But what I want you to do is get the physical picture. In delta G, all of you know delta G is two components, delta H and enthalpy and entropy component. Now you should be able to relate between what contributes for the delta H and what contributes for the delta H. The delta H comes from all these held and bonds and van der The delta H comes from water. The substrate is surrounded by water. Of course, in the free enzyme, in the active site, it also is water, right? There won't be a free pocket, it will be filled up with water. So when the substrate comes in, substrate is full of water, you, it goes in, this is full of water. When it goes in, water is around, this is released, water is in this pocket is also released. Right? You take a cup, you fill it with sand, Okay, all the water is going to go out. Which is a favorable situation where the maximum waters are also happy. Right? Entropy of the system increases. Okay, so you see the connection. Okay, this, this is why biology is so interesting. Okay? We can relate all of this now to the molecular level, to the physics and chemistry of the situation. Okay, people have derived all of this. People have actually done experiments and uh, proved that these numbers are correct. Of course, it's very difficult to do single molecule experiment. You are not doing this with one protein atom or one, one protein molecule. No, you are doing it in, you know, in a bulk phase. But these numbers are all reliable now. 
Okay, people have done simulations and done experiments and you know figured out uh, that all these uh, hypotheses are true. Okay, so let me give you another uh, example. Okay, all of you know what a resonance is. What is a resonance? What an isomerase? What kind of amino acids do we have? Natural amino acids. What is the configuration? L. L amino acid. Do we have D amino acids? But do we have it in our proteins? In a natural system on earth, all the proteins, what amino acids do they have? L or D? L. Don't forget that. You know D amino acids. D amino acids are there, that's three amino acids, but they are not in any proteins. Remember that. What about sugars? Biological systems? That is D. D sugars and L amino acids. Right? Do you, can you figure out what is L and D if I give you an amino acid? Do you know? Okay. Go back not. Okay. So uh, the resonance is something which converts L into D or D into L. Okay? So this is the proline resonance, right? Which converts L into D. I think you can recognize this, right? These perspective formulas, right? This is H into the plane. This is H also. This is the tetrahedral carbon here. Okay? That's why you should know your, you should be able to figure out which is L and D. Right now, of course, I'm telling you this is L and this is D. Okay? So the enzyme is doing this conversion. Now, how does it do it? Okay? Tetrahedral carbon. H is pointing out, this is L amino acid. What's happening in D? Okay? H is here, L amino acid in D. It's going down. The enzyme is doing that. So what is the hypothesis? This is, you start with L, it's sitting in your enzyme. What is the enzyme doing? It should be able to block off the hydrogen and put it here. That is the reaction. Is that what's happening? Actually happening. Okay. That is what I am going to show you in one of these structures. So what is the transition state here? The transition state is where you have taken the H, it was a tetrahedral carbon, right? An amino acid is a tetrahedral group. Right? I hope you remember that. The way I drew it is like that. Okay, it's a tetrahedral group. So from a tetrahedral group, that group becomes planar. Okay, that is the transition state. So when it goes from uh, L to D, when you pull out this hydrogen, what was a tetrahedral group becomes a planar group. The hydrogen, when it's pushed back in, it becomes a tetrahedral group again. That is the hypothesis. So transition state is a planar group, which is what is proposed here. Remember, you see this, this is a double bond, so it's going to be all planar. Okay? So you can actually synthesize this. See, this is almost an aromatic group. An aromatic group is usually planar. So this is a good transition state analog. Okay? And this is a good uh, you know substrate analog. This looks like this, right? The substrate itself. So you can test all these three. Okay. What is the transition state hypothesis telling you? The enzyme is most complementary to transition state. When I say complementary, how will you measure it? The word complementary you understand. But can you give a number to it? Remember anything? Any, any word? Have you heard of affinity? Dissociation constant? Is that a physical number? Yes. Right? So you can calculate a KA or a KD, association or dissociation. That is a physical number, right? So if something is more complementary, what is the KD or KA? It's going to change, right? If something is more complementary, it should, the association should be tighter. Your KA should be very high or KD should be much lower. Okay? So how should your transition state bind? If you compare it with your substrate, what is the KA? 
transition state to the other side, what should be the K? K should be high for the transition state. If you show that, have you proven that theory correct? Yes. Okay, of course, this proof theory was done, I told you, 50, 60 years back. But now we have has to prove it. You can synthesize this and actually show that the transition state is more. Okay, so for everything we have a physical basis now. Okay, that is the power of uh, you know doing biology these days. Okay, that's what I'm trying to motivate people into. Okay, these days you can do all experiments with the right tools, right techniques, and prove a lot of stuff. Okay, there's so much interesting stuff you can do these days. Okay, you can still be interested in something which is very you know, uh, chemistry oriented or physics oriented or something which is very quantitative sciences, you can easily practice it in biology. Okay. So they have done this uh, structure of this enzyme and this is what is the active site. Okay. These are, this is the substrate. Okay. Now looking at the substrate and all these interactions, Okay, this is another picture of it. Can you figure out which amino acids are very important for this reaction? Now you can, because you have the structure in place. This is the substrate, right? These are all the amino acids from your enzyme. Okay, what is D two amino acids? What is D? Which amino acid? Is what amino acid is D? Aspartate, good. Some of you at least know. Okay, what is H? Histidine. What is C? Histidine, good. Okay, so the active site of this enzyme looks like it has 116 here, 130, another cysteine, which is C300. Okay, there is a cysteine here, there is a cysteine here, and they are exactly in position on either side of the rolling. This is a real structure, experimentally determined structure. So what is the hypothesis? That, but uh, look at the distances, okay? Uh, between this cysteine and this cysteine and so on, you can measure the distances, okay? And come up with the hypothesis. Which is the amino acid pulling out the proton from here? Right, and pushing the proton into this, right? So that is the hypothesis. Now the structure, it gives you the proof because it's a real structure. It's an it's experimentally determined structure. Okay? So the hypothesis is this. There is a cysteine on top. Do you know what the side chain of cysteine is? What is the argument? S. S H. Okay, that's the reduced form. Can it give away the proton? Yes. What is the PKA of cysteine? You know what PKA is, right? Or you don't know? PKA of cysteine is where? Around 7, 8. Yeah. Okay. Which means you can lose the proton, you can gain a proton. Okay. Okay, let me ask you another question. Uh, what is the PKA of glue aspartate? Can aspartate? Give away a proton and gain a proton? Aspartic acid. Why do you call it an acid? Because it can give away a proton. It can run a proton, right? What's the PK? Not two. Of course, the only basic vitamins. Okay? So, cysteine can actually so, after you do this structure, does it make sense to propose cysteine as a very important amino acid for catalysis? Right? You are looking at the structure, substrate is here, cysteine is sitting right on top. Okay? There is aspartate, histidine somewhere here, aspartate sitting here and so on. There is cysteine here, there is another cysteine here. If I ask you to write the mechanism now, will you propose that this is very important? Right? You know what's happening. You are saying that something should pick up a hydrogen from here and put it at the bottom. You are looking at it. You are seeing what cysteine here, what histidine here, and aspartate. Aspartate can take a proton, yeah. But where is it? It's sitting somewhere here. 
Where is the Sistine city? Very close to this problem. So, common sense says, Sistine is probably taking a proton from here, okay? And there is another Sistine here. It is not the same proton which is coming. That is what you should remember, okay? This can abstract a proton, this will get proton free. And then there is another Sistine which is already in the SH form. That will donate a proton. The bottom will get a H. That is exactly what this mechanism is. Okay, proline sitting here. One cysteine is on top, abstracts a proton, okay, keeps it. After its taking, the enzyme recognizes that now there is a planar group, a transition state, no protons. The bottom cysteine gives the proton. Now you get a cysteine and a proton in the. So have you converted L into D? Yes, that's what it is. This is the magic of doing structures, I keep telling you. If you didn't have this structure, you can't prove any of this, right? Of course, you can do biochemical, biochemical experiment, you can mutate this system and see the effect on activity. You can mutate this system, see the effect of activity. But how do you know that system is the one you have to mutate without the structure? Can you predict that? No, you can't. If I give you simply the protein sequence, can you mutate that one system? How many amino acids? It's a big protein. Which amino acid will you mutate? How many possibilities? You can't. But the moment you get the structure, now you know which to mutate. Anybody with some little common sense and some little understanding of chemistry will naturally mutate these two systems. So now you see the relationship between how to understand enzyme function from doing the structure. That is my topic, structural enzymology, right? Biochemical experiments, you know, you can do some of these things, you can show activity, but you cannot figure out what's happening, right? So this is, this you can actually explain even to a child, if you show him the diagram and the model. How to take a proton from here and put it in. It's not the same proton, you have one amino acid here, take a proton, the other amino acid is giving it activity. So that happens in a cycle. Where are these protons coming from? They are coming from the bulk water. Remember, all your protein, protein outside, everything has been solution, right? Water dissociates, you know. H plus, OH minus. So plenty of hydrogens around, right? What is the role of the amino acid enzyme itself? To be very selective, right? To hold the proline substrate which is exactly inside, to keep it completely enclosed so that only one proton can come in or go out at any time. You understand now? Now it comes back to my first question. Why do you need an elephant to carry a peanut? Right? You can carry a peanut with a small uh, spoon. Okay? But what's the problem with the spoon? It can fall down from the spoon. You can't carry it for long distances. Right? It might, uh, you know, the peanut might simply jump, it might get damaged, right? But when you use something as big as an elephant, you know, it can carry it very safely. And the same thing with an enzyme. The substrate is really small. All you are doing is taking a proton out and putting it. But why do you need such a big protein to do such a small thing? Essentially, it is regulation. Right? Unless you, you know, you build a very complex object, you cannot do this the way you want. You will get all sorts of side reactions, you will get all sorts of other problems. Okay, this is a fundamental issue in all of biology. You all must be thinking, why nature makes so complicated molecules who are doing small things? Because you can do the same thing in a test tube. You can convert L into D using chemistry. In a test tube, you know, you do the right catalyst, you know, you can do it. Okay, but what will be the conditions? There will be high temperature, high pressure, you know, sodium borohydride and something like that, you know. But in your body, can you have that kind of things? You have to do it at 7 degrees, 7 pH and under mild conditions in your body. So that's why you need an enzyme. In an enzyme, you can create a very localized environment which is completely regulated. Okay? Very important. So that's what 
the structure gives, and that is what is true. Okay, so you can do the biochemical experiments, you can start with the proline, heat proline, you can actually mutate these amino acids. This is the white type you see. This is the cysteine mutated to you know, serine. This cysteine mutated to serine, you see activity is completely lost. Right? So the biochemistry is supporting the, the structure. Okay, so this is the connection between structure and process. And you can actually see here, okay? This is the active site. There are two structures here. One of it is the APO form. APO form is the free form. You have a holo form. Holo form is the substrate bond form. Can you see any difference? Between the APO form and the holo form? Structures of those two. They are superposed. Can you see any difference? There, this is ribbon diagram. It's also here. What has happened? This is a ribbon diagram. The green is, let's say, the polar form, the red is the echo form. What happens? Can you see the structure has closed? Take this region. What has happened to this region? It's moved here, right? That's what's happening here. It was a very open cavity here. Gets closed. What was open here? Gets closed. This is what you must have heard again. What is called induced fit, right? And the substrate was in the protein closes, right? Why is it closing? What's the advantage of closing? When you go closer, what happens? You are generating all non-covalent interactions again. Right? If it was open, there are no, you know, you put some small object, there are no hydrogen points and other things. Where is energy coming? To break it? No. It has to close so that it makes all the hydrogen points. Right? You want someone, you want to have some energy transfer. Right? So there is change in the protein structure. That is why you need to determine the structure of the empty form and the bone form. Okay, now that you have the bone form, you can calculate all these interactions and add up the numbers and see for L proline to D proline, what is the delta G of the reaction, you know. When you've done the structure, does it add up? You know, does the those the energy contributed by non-covalent interactions, does it add up to the delta G of the reaction? Tags up, fine. You have explained everything. Okay. This is a very, very reasonably straightforward example of how enzyme function. Okay. It's a very, very straightforward textbook uh, example of how uh, enzymes uh, work. You can do the same thing with different enzymes. Okay. So during this step, you can have so many things happening. Okay. Reactions can take place. Simply because the proximity and the orientation. If you change the orientation by half a degree, reaction will not happen. Okay? If you want to make a bond between two groups, you know they won't happen unless you bring the two together. Right? So what is the role of the enzyme there? To bring the two groups together. Right? That's proximity. So many things can do, you know, you know, maybe the enzyme is playing the role of desolvation. Desolvation is what I told you. Substrate comes with lot of waters, pull out the water, that is desolvation. That is a lot, you know, a lot of energy thing. You, you know, you can have reduced rate, you can have nice, nice uh, what do you call, transient state binding. You can have the general acid base, which, which is what I was telling you about. Cysteine can be in the acid form or in the base form. Right? Acid form is where it can actually give the proton. Base form is where it has lost the base, you know, proton. That's what a distribution an acid from a base. Right? When do you call aspartate uh, acid? If it is having the proton, you call it an acid. If it has lost its proton, what do you call it? 
conjugate this. Right? That's what you should use. Okay? So you can do this. So this one enzyme can actually be doing all of this. How do you figure out whether this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, or this is happening? By looking at the structure. You have seen the structure, you can write an essay on all this. Okay, the enzyme is using acid base catalysis. It is using induced grid, right? It is also using desolvation. It is also using orientation, okay, and so on. Okay. In the absence of the structure, you can't make out this. Thing. So this is all hypothesis. What your enzyme is doing is clear from all of these things. But when you look at the structure, okay?